the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old, praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season on the soul. If we could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely Joining with the angels, praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, calling all the nations to your praise. If they could see how much you're, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never Now, I'm not sure if we've got any children in church, but I'd like to give you an update uh, for our children. They're very much on our hearts at the moment with schools going back. Uh, and they have been back a couple of weeks. And it is, um, I was in school last week and it is stressful. Um, they're managing, but it is stressful for families as uh, the rules are changing so quickly and we want to try and keep everybody safe. So keep families and schools, please, in your prayers, particularly this week. Also, um, we would like to give an update on the appointment process for our family minister, youth worker or digital and or digital support worker. And to say that applications are coming in, we're encouraged. The deadline is uh, Friday the 25th of September, so there's still time to apply if you're considering any of those positions. Please just be led by God. And also to report that on Friday we had our second assembly online with St Luke's Church here in Sway and it is a joy and in the midst of their pressurised environment to be able to beam into every classroom and it's done just from here into the classrooms at the moment. Um, it was a joy and very well received and they've asked for more which is great so um, we're looking at how we might uh, resource that and offer it at this time of um, quite high stress. We've got a great um, children's song now, Great Big God. And if you're in the church, you can jump around and do the actions. Well, you can at home too. So let's have that. God is a great big God. Oh, 
Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. He's higher than a skyscraper. He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe. Beyond my wildest dreams And he's known me And he's loved me Since before the world began How wonderful To be a part Of God's amazing plan Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God us in his hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. He's higher than a skyscraper. He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And he's no as he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. And He holds us in His hand. And he holds us in His hand. And he holds us in His hands. And He holds us in His hand. Sometimes God's truths speak clearer to us in the children's songs and stories than when we get on more complicated stuff. And the fact that that reassurance that God holds us in his hands at this uncertain time is a biblical truth that we can all hold on to. So let's continue in our worship. We have a couple of songs, Shout to the Lord, and then All Heaven Declares, Chosen with the Harvest and Creation uh, theme in mind. My Jesus, my Savior, for there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the one. Of your mighty love, my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship.
all heaven declares the beauty of the glorious Lord. So as we come to our reading, and if you've got your Bibles at home, it's from Romans 8 this morning, starting at verse 18. Verse 18 to the end. No, verse 18 to 30. Romans 8, 18 to 30. Um, and let's pray as Ruth Herod has recorded the reading for us, and then we'll go straight into the talk by our guest speaker. Father, we do thank you for your word. Help us this morning for whatever distractions are around us. Help us to focus on you, Lord Jesus. Help us turn our face to your face. Help us breathe in and receive new revelation and truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So thank you, Ruth. Today's reading is from Romans 8, verses 18 to 30. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, for those God for knew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome to Joe, Joe Swinney. And you're sitting um, at the top of the house in Bath, I believe. Can you, um, well, hello and welcome. Can you introduce yourself and how do we know each other? <clears throat> well, we know each other from Bath. I am. I'm sitting at the top of um, the vicarage, as it happens, because I am not a vicar. Um, I'm a vicar's wife. And um, we have the most lovely tall house that looks out over Coombe Down, which is just the south of Bath. Uh, which is how we know each other because not too very long we were almost neighbours. We were, we were up to a year, just over a year ago, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, what a year. <laughs> what a fun and you live there with your husband and children? Yes, we have two girls. They are um, 10 and 13. And uh, two, yeah, lovely kids and two cats. <laughs> And your role is uh, the National Director for Communications for Arosha UK. Is that correct? Have I got that no, right? No, it isn't actually. Oh. I'm Head of Communications for Arosha International. Oh, sorry. That's, well, right. like That's to fine. This <laughs> well, let me pray for you and we'll all pray for you as uh, you come to bring us a word this morning on Romans 8. Thank you. Father God, we do thank you for Joe and for all who work and have worked for this conservation charity, this Christian conservation charity, dwelling in nature and your word with a heart to share your creation with others as a response of your great love to us. So we pray for Joe this morning. 
Shower her, we pray, with your blessings. Help us to receive more of your word and what it means to be Eco Church and to share the love of God through creation. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jane. And hello, St. Luke's. And I wish I could be there in person to greet you and to meet you and to see lovely Jane again. Um, I it's difficult and it's weird talking to you like this but I'm also very grateful for technology and um, and that there are these ways that we can be church and be together even under a lockdown so I gather that as a church you are beginning a journey of becoming an eco church and I wonder if you might have had a little quiet snigger to yourself when you first heard the name eco church and maybe you even thought gosh what next maybe crafting church or pacifist church or a sporty church i'm going to be looking at three characteristics of an eco church from our romans passage that will hopefully clear things up a bit but before i do i'd like to tell you a little bit about my story and why i'm the person speaking to you on this topic as Jane said, I am. Um, I do work for Arosha International, but my story goes back a bit further than that. When I was five, my parents became missionaries and we moved to Portugal, the Algarve to be specific, hard missionary posting that it was. They weren't going to evangelise, however, or plant a church or translate the Bible into Portuguese or any of the more other traditional missionary activities. They were going to live out God's creation, um, God's call to care for his creation by protecting a vulnerable area of wetland on a key migration route between North Africa and Europe. In the early 1980s, the idea of creation care as mission was very novel and they got quite a few barbed comments along the lines of, so going to convert the birds, are you? Which I suppose were people um, getting at the fact that in some minds, at least at that point, maybe many minds, um, true spiritual activity had to do with souls um, and not much else. The organisation they founded, Arosha, is now active in 21 countries, uh, on all inhabited continents of the world. It carries out community conservation projects, scientific studies, environmental education for churches and schools and universities, and it works to protect endangered habitats, all in God's name and for his glory. I grew up in the first field study centre um, in Portugal, living there until I was 17, and um, now, as a grown-up, I find myself back there um, and working for them. So, what is an eco-church? I'm not going to talk about the eco-church scheme that um, you may have recently signed up to. I want to come at the question from a wider angle, because I believe that any church that reflects the biblical picture of what a church should be is an eco-church. It's not a matter of a quirky special interest or a unique selling point to make you stand out from other churches around your area. It goes to the heart of who we are and what we are for as church. So the first characteristic of an eco church is that it understands its redeemed relationship, not just to God and between people, but with the whole of creation, a redeemed relationship that God has designed for us to have with the whole creation. When we read Romans 8, we often zero in on what it says about humanity, our sufferings, our hope for freedom and glory. But if we look at it a bit closely now, we'll see this is only part of the picture. The creation waits in eager expectation we see in verse 19. The creation was subject for, to frustration in verse 20, the creation itself will be liberated, is verse 21, and the whole creation has been groaning, in verse 22. 
Paul was writing in what is known as the Holocene era for you geologists, uh, which was around 12,000 years of climate stability. This enabled humans to flourish and prosper. They could settle down, they could develop complicated societies, agricultural systems, um, they could um, grow as civilizations because they had a relatively stable and predictable set of climate um, circumstances. Some seasons the rain didn't come or too much came and there were floods. Disease struck herds and blighted crops. Species were overhunted and became extinct. Creation has suffered along with humanity, arguably, ever since the fall. But we are in new territory now. Since the 1950s, the scale of human impact has tipped us into an entirely new geological era known as the Anthropocene. We have put Earth's life-giving systems under intolerable stress. Our burning of fossil fuels has led to unprecedented concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The safe limit is reckoned to be 350 parts per million. We're at 400 and climbing rapidly. This is leading to a hotter, drier climate and rising sea levels. We've put more than double safe levels of toxic synthetic fertilizers into our soil. And since 1970, the number of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians and fish has fallen by half. I don't know if any of you watched last week's um, David Attenborough documentary on BBC One, Extinction, The Facts. It was incredibly depressing viewing, to put it mildly. So in looking to express the kind of agony creation experiences, Paul reaches for the metaphor of labour. Creation groans as in the pangs of childbirth. Anyone who's given birth will tell you that the pangs of childbirth are a whole other world of pain. Um, as Jane said, I've had two children. Before my first, I was all about um, breathing through the pangs and um, hopping in and out of some kind of nicely scented water um, water pool and I was going to listen to worship music and have candles and it was all going to be very natural and manageable. When it came to my second I came screeching into the labour ward yelling at the top of my voice for, uh, for an epidural because I knew what was coming. God hears the groaning of all creation and he cares. His love extends to everything that he's made. His good intentions for redemption and eternal flourishing are for everything, not just people. So what does this have to do with us, with church? The biblical theologian Ellen Davis writes in her book, Getting Involved with God, which is a brilliant book. I would heartily recommend it. She says, the ecological crisis is essentially not a technological crisis, but a theological one. It is a massive disordering in our relationship with God, the creator of heaven and earth. So essentially, when we mistreat creation, when any human dis mistreats creation, that's stemming from a broken relationship with God, is what she's arguing. The disorienting and reorienting message of the Bible is, she goes on, simply stated, righteousness means living in humble, careful and godly relationship with the soil on which the life of every one of us wholly depends. So the second characteristic of an eco-church is that it worships God through both word and action. Worship, um, as you know, is not just about singing um, songs with the God subject to God. It's anything done from love, reverence, submission and obedience to God. And it involves shaping our character and our priorities around God's. So God loves the poor. And that's why as a church, you, St. Luke's, worship him by caring for the poor. God's heart is for the lost and that's why I see on your website that you run Alpha and I'm sure that you look for every other way you can 
to share your faith and extend hospitality to those who don't know Jesus in Sway and beyond. God desires those who love him to love each other and that is why as a church you worship him by supporting each other in need, by meeting as you are able in groups of six or less at the moment um, and online and sharing life. So what would it look like for us if we really understood our treatment of the world as another expression of worship? What would change if we understood the size of our carbon footprint as a measure of our love for Jesus? Or if we made travel, food, investment or housing choices out of a conscious desire to please God and honour what he holds dear? They're difficult questions and I ask them of myself really often. So the third characteristic of an eco church is that it is hopeful. We do not accept as Christians the narrative that the sinful catastrophic abuse of the planet will lead to its destruction. Yes, there is present suffering, but there's also eager expectation of a coming glory. And we are full of hope for the redemption of our bodies, as it says in um, verse 23. So catch the significance of that. There's a future for embodied life, an eternal future for our physicality, and not just our physicality, but that of the whole world around us. Physical matter is not the opposite of spiritual. When we know something has lasting value, we treat it differently. A man using a disposable razor is not going to worry about leaving it dirty and damp by the side of the sink to rust. However, if he has a one blade, collector's edition black blade, retailing at the moment at around £2,500, that he intends to leave to his son in his will, he's going to get more careful treatment. And more so if he inherited it from his own father. The church is to live in the world in a way that demonstrates its lasting worth. Each small act of care and respect for creation is a symbol and a sign that we have hope for it in the long term. As each believer does the right thing with every small choice before us, the impact of our communal effort will change the face of the earth. As some of you may know, um, there was a terrible accident last October in South Africa, a road accident in which my mother and the executive director of Arusha International, Chris Naylor, and his wife, Susanna, were killed. This has been a time of great grief for the Naylor and Harris families, my family, and also for the Arusha family worldwide. But we remain full of hope because our story arches towards redemption and transformation. And we believe we are in the hands of a loving, faithful creator God who has great eternal plans for our good. You'll see a picture now um, on your screens, hopefully. It's of the Amik wetland in the summer of 1997. This is where Chris and Susanna Naylor worked for many years um, in conservation for Arosha. And this is what Chris said about the Amik wetland. When we started working there, the sheep and the goats were grazing the marshes in their thousands. The hunters were shooting the birds out of the sky even as you went to visit. Pitnickers were leaving rubbish, which was catching in the reeds and the trees. The tenant farmers were pumping water through the summer to drain this precious resource. So it was hanging on by a thread. We felt very strongly with others we had to do something about it. We felt a call to write the gospel in the landscape. To recognise that our fantastic God loves this place just as he loves the individuals and community around it. He actually loves the place too. He loves the Bekar. He loves the marshes in the shadow of Mount Hermon, brooding with its snow-capped peak just to the south. And I love to think that Jesus might even have looked out over the Bekar from Mount Hermon 
and he would have seen 2,000 years ago this thriving wetland and now he was grieving because it was so small and so damaged and so abused and he wanted us with others to do something about it. So the second picture is the Bacar Valley in the summer of 2007. There you see the gospel of hope written into the landscape. So what is an eco church? And the picture can come down if you want. An eco church is one that lives out its redeemed relationship to all of creation. It's a church that worships by reflecting God's heart towards all it has made. And it's a church that holds out hope to a world teetering on the edge of despair. We've talked about things on a big scale this morning and perhaps you're feeling somewhat overwhelmed or, or unsure about what to do next. I think maybe our first response should be repentance. Speaking for myself, I know this is an area of great failure, continual and habitual failure, uh, willful disobedience and denial. But as with any sin, we come to God knowing that our Father is merciful and patient and kind beyond anything we could expect from him. And as Paul reminds us in verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, interceding for us through wordless groans. True repentance also results in change. So let's give some honest thought to what God might be calling us to do differently. And that is something that we can work on every day. And there's lots of resources out there. And I think Eco Church will be a really great scheme for you guys um, as you get to grips with this whole subject. So I'm just going to pray in closing. Father God, thank you for this beautiful, complex, intricate and awe-inspiring creation of yours. It tells us so much about who you are, your might and power, your care and concern, your exuberant creativity and joy. We are sorry, Lord, for behaving as though this world is our own personal resource to sap in pursuit of wealth and comfort. We are sorry for worshipping you with our mouths and not with our lives. Forgive us and lead us into a new way of living that honours you and enables the whole world to flourish. Amen. Amen. And thank you so much to Joe for taking the time to reach out to us and share with us uh, the gospel message of redemption, both physically and spiritually, in perhaps a new way, helping us think wider. So I'm going to go straight into prayer now and invite you to pray uh, with me. So let us pray. Father, at this uncertain time and at this time where so many things are going towards extinction, we pray that as a church, you will guide us in your will. Lord, just as our praise and our arms lifted aloft in praise of your love, we pray for your praise through the landscape. Help us to know what thick steps to take. Help us to know individually at home uh, our daily decisions that will bring praise to you in our gardens and our homes and how we live. Thank you for that photograph of the difference showing the gospel of hope written into the landscape. So we pray for our church here at St Luke's. We pray for ourselves, but we also, Lord, pray for all those who work to protect your uh, beautiful world. We pray for Arosha. We pray for Joe and those who work at the charity across the world. 
We pray for all those organisations that seek to protect uh, animals, plants, wildlife. And as we are in a way uniquely placed in the new forest, in your beauty, we pray for you to show us the steps we take to protect your world. We pray for St Luke's School and give you thanks for all they've do, done and doing in teaching young people to protect your world, to care for creation. And as we look to the time ahead, we look at how we can engage young people together and witness the gospel through joint projects or ventures with St Luke's School. And at this time of harvest, we give thanks for food. And we pray and give thanks for all those who've worked for the food bank and continue to do. Thank you for Marion and those who volunteer. Thank you for those who distribute the food to those in need, particularly during this lockdown. And we pray for us all as we face uh, uncertain times and perhaps more announcements this week or next about um, restrictions. Give us your wisdom, we pray. Help us protect and care for our neighbour. Give us your strength and your wisdom. And just in a moment of quiet, let's have a reflective time um, thinking about um, Joe's talk and that passage from Romans about the eager expectation of a future glory, the redemption both physically and spiritually of the Lord. So we offer all these prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, continuing on our theme, we now have a short interview with Lucy from the church, from our church here, and who is our administrator in the church office. Well, good morning, Lucy. Well, good morning, Lucy. Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. And we're on this day when we're celebrating harvest. And we're thinking of creation and we've got Arosha, the Christian conservation charity. Tell us, you've got an exciting new course coming up. I have. I'm going to be doing a BCM, which is a Bishop's Commission for Mission. Right. Um, and it's going to be on creation care. And it's new. They've just started it and it's going to be, this one's going to be online. Fantastic. And that's through the Diocese of Winchester, is that yes. right? Yes, yeah. Wow, and there were over 50 applicants, but we're allowed one person per yeah. parish, and you're our person. I am. And we're supporting you through the PTC, and we hope that you really enjoy the course. Do you like living in the New Forest and the wonderful place we live? I love living in the New Forest. I'm better in all the greenery rather than in cities. Uh -huh. um, I just think, it's all about being bringing yourself back to nature and just going back to the roots and god's creations and isn't this just fantastic it's beautiful and we are on a beautiful morning so having seen god in creation how do you think the course might help us as a church consider his creation i'm hoping that um, it brings us back to looking after God's world and everything that's in it. I mean, Adam was made from the earth, therefore we were all made from the earth. And I think that core idea is really, really important. Maybe make us more eco. Thank you. And I think you've got a question. For yes. Me? I just wanted to know, what does St Luke's think about eco church or care for creation? Wow, I'm going to stand slightly closer. In fact, could you just pass me your mic? Yeah. Thank you. So we're standing two metres apart in the garden. Um, 
my hope for St Luke's is that if God directs that we will become a church that really considers creation as one of the five marks of mission. They're one of the five marks of mission through the Church of England, where we believe that God made us and he made everything uh, in creation. And so what is our response as a church? I, through the way we uh, live and operate day by day as a church, practically and spiritually, but also in our mission and our wider um, impact, if you like, uh, and social justice and uh, what, what, what action are we taking? So my hope is that uh, if people are interested, we'll form a small group. Uh, you're doing the course, which is great, and that the Lord will lead us step by step in his will to do things better in his name. Simple as that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to all those who contributed. And uh, if you're inspired and interested, we'll need to set a date um, for a gathering, probably online, uh, for those who might be interested and discuss this topic just a little bit further. Just in terms of um, notices and parish news, to let you know that next Sunday is our St Luke's Vision Sunday. The PCC have been thinking very much over the past year about the future direction. and. Um, We've got some paperwork to uh, share next next Sunday uh, when Archdeacon Peter will be with us. So it's really looking, we've had so much change. It's really looking at where we are now since COVID changes and where we hope to go over the next five years and just setting some clear objectives about how we might do that. So we look forward to that next weekend. So now we move into, actually just one more thing about harvest. Um, this year particularly, we've been asked if you would like to contribute, it's probably easier to um, uh, contribute uh, money financially rather than the tins and things. So if that's your, um, if you'd like to do that, please um, contact Lucy in the church office and we'll make sure that your donations, your financial do donations go to the food bank to support those in need. Um, I've just had a message up saying, could the talk go on the Facebook or the website? Yes, it definitely will. As always, we put our uninterrupted uh, service on our Facebook page, which is embedded in our website. So in either place, you should see it from tomorrow. We'll give the rest of today to sort out our tech. Great. So let our song now is At Your Name. So enjoy our worship with all that going around in our heads, um, giving praise to God at his name. Praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to 
Thank you for joining us today. Um, there's the traditional service at 11 o'clock, um, which will be um, in church and uh, online. You're very welcome to join us. And uh, this week, there's the prayer meeting on Thursday uh, at 7.30 p.m. So a blessing to close. Father, we ask for your blessing on our homes and our families this day. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, have a good week and enjoy the talk again if, when we put it on Facebook. Okay, bye.